I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. It's summertime, and many of us on the East Coast and near Midwest are suffering from the hot, hot, hot heat that we're dealing with, and it's got everybody thinking about going to the beach. I personally am always thinking about going to the beach. It's my favorite place to be in the world, and I'll be headed to a fantastic beach just after July 4th. I wanted to find out about the water quality at our beaches because this is hugely important and we've been dealing with, you know, some issues out in California where the fires and the Palisades have, you know, made the water contaminated for a bit. But I wanted to talk to the people who really study this and Mara Diaz is joining us. She's the Water Quality Initiative Senior Manager at the Surfrider Foundation, also an organization that's near and dear to my heart. You can find them on their website. Just look up Surfrider Foundation, buy a cool t-shirt or something, support them. They're absolutely fantastic and they do great work. Mara leads the Blue Water Task Force, a nationally recognized volunteer-driven water sampling program that monitors hundreds of U.S. beaches for pollution. She oversees the federal clean water campaigns and advocates for stronger public health protections at beaches. And at the Surfrider Foundation, she stewards a team of over 50 labs nationwide, ensuring that communities have timely science-based information about water quality. Mara, thanks for coming on to talk about this issue. It's summertime, and like I said, everybody's headed to the beach. So can you tell us a little bit about what the Blue Water Task Force does? Yeah, sure. You know, the Blue Water Task Force has been around for just about 30 years now. And it started when our members, who were at the time often surfers, were you know at the beach and wondering, is this water actually safe for us to go into or not? And this was before a lot of states had their own beach water quality monitoring programs. And so we started to do some very basic testing back 30 years ago. Since then, a lot of states are monitoring their beaches, but there's plenty of gaps, plenty of beaches that aren't monitored at all, or especially on the East Coast, there's not a lot of testing during the fall, winter, and spring months. So what Surfrider has done is really set up this program to allow our volunteer-run chapters to go out, test water quality at the beach and other coastal waterways where people get in and they recreate, but there isn't enough water quality information available to let people know where is it safe to swim and, you know, where should they stay out. So at this point, we have, geez, over 60 labs now. located. 60. Across, yeah, located across the country. We're testing over 600 sites and really providing that information to the local communities where our chapters exist on water quality. Is it safe to swim? Are there pollution issues here? And when we find pollution problems, we often reach out to local decision makers, stakeholders, and say, hey, we think we have a problem here. Let's dig in and figure this out. So lots of our listeners are in the D.C. area and enjoy our beaches to the south in North Carolina, but also our eastern shore beaches, which are just absolutely beloved. I'm talking about Ocean City, Maryland, at Bethany Beach, Delaware, and Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, Dewey Beach, Delaware. It's where I you know, grew up going to those beaches. And on the East Coast, we always think that everything's regulated and it's safe. But it's really interesting to hear that the East Coast beaches are a lot of the ones that haven't really been thoroughly studied. And you know, clearly the West Coast has pioneered this. My favorite place to go on the West Coast is Malibu, where I'm headed in a couple weeks. Tell us about the East Coast first, and then tell us about the West Coast. You know, I think we definitely on the East Coast find plenty of beaches where we're testing, where we run into some problems, where we see some high bacteria counts. And I think a lot of the reason for that is we enjoy such a diversity of coastal waters here along the East Coast, right? You know, there's a lot of ocean beaches with the Atlantic Ocean, but then there's a lot of bay beaches, estuaries, you know, so I live on the eastern end of Long Island, we have our Atlantic Ocean beaches, and then there's the Peconic Bay, which is in between the north and the south fork of Long Island. And then between Long Island and Connecticut, there's a Long Island Sound. And what we find sort of across the board is that ocean beaches typically tend to test clean because it's just such this massive amount of water. So even if there is pollution coming off of the land into the water, it sort of dissipates relatively quickly, unless there's some big event. Yeah, the pollution can hang around more on more of these bays and coastal ponds and other type of estuaries that we're blessed with here on the East Coast. We worry about the Chesapeake Bay here, you know, all the time. It's a treasure. 
Exactly. So if you, you know, you slide over to say California on the West Coast, there aren't the same big massive estuarine systems where people are getting in and recreating. You know, it's largely, there are some for sure. There's some harbors and stuff, but mostly, you know, where our chapters are, we're testing ocean beaches, which again, tend to be clean unless it's rained really hard or there's some sort of sewage failure somewhere. Yeah. And usually we see when there's some kind of sewage failure on the West Coast, there's newspaper coverage, there's media coverage. But tell me, what are the most common misconceptions people have about water quality and beach safety? And how do you address them? Well, I think the biggest thing is when people head to the beach, generally, they're not thinking about water quality at all right? Like they're thinking about what's the weather going to be? Is it going to rain? What's the UV index? You know, like what's the wind going to be? Maybe if you're a surfer, you're looking at a tide chart or paying attention to the wind. But most people don't think about water quality. And actually, it's as important, if not more important than the rest of those physical conditions that we look at when we plan a day at the beach, because it can really influence how much fun you have at the beach and, you know, how much you pay for it later, right? Nobody wants to spend a great day at the beach surfing in the water and then go home and they're feeling ill for the next three days because they were exposed to pollution and they had no idea. So Mara, I think I know the answer to this, but I have to ask, why is coastal water quality a national security and public health issue and not just a local environmental concern? Let me start with public health first, because that's everywhere, right? So what we measure in the water and what departments of health and in every coastal state look at is fecal indicator bacteria. If these fecal indicator bacteria levels are high, then that tells you, oh, there's probably human or animal waste in the water. And in that, there could be pathogens, bacteria, viruses that can make humans sick, right? And so that's why it's a public health consideration. If there's sewage in the water, animal waste, to less of a degree, but certainly it can affect you, people can get sick from being in the water. That's everywhere. Now, if we look at where our chapter in San Diego operates, right there on the border with Mexico, there's a lot of wastewater that's not treated properly there along the border. So there's these massive discharges of untreated sewage and storm water that goes into the Pacific Ocean right there at the border. And it's closing the beaches that people enjoy swimming in, like some of them nearly every single day for the past three years. And even just a little bit further north, like let's say I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's somewhere around 200 to 250 days out of the year, which that's awful. If you think, here I live in Imperial Beach, California. I love to go to the beach. That's why I'm here. And it's actually dangerous for me to go into the water more often than that. Now, bringing it into a national security realm, you have Navy SEALs that train there. And a report just came out, I think late last year, showing the impact of that polluted water on Navy SEALs who train there. Our border patrol has to work in those waters and the estuary that's along the border that's contaminated and can cause them to get sick. So in that area, that public health issue that could be affecting people anywhere turns into a national security issue. Interesting. And what policies do you want to see implemented to address this problem? And it seems like the problem's growing, even though we're monitoring it more, you're monitoring it more. What would you like to see? Well, Surf Riders Blue Water Task Force program continues to grow every single year, but state agency and funded programs haven't grown every single year. The Beach Act passed back in 2000, and that really established a beach grant program at EPA and funded that which gave guidelines to coastal states on how to run their beach monitoring programs and how to notify the public when contamination was detected. This passed back in 2000. So in in 2021, just under $10 million was allocated from the federal government to help pay for the beach programs in 35 coastal states and territories, right? Over the last 25 years, that program has received just under $10 million every single year. And guess what? $10 $10 million pays for a lot less now than it did 25 years ago, as you can imagine. So what happens is coastal states every year have to think about how can I best spend my diminishing federal grants so that I can have the biggest bang for the buck on where to protect public health. 
So if anything, the agency programs are forced to scale back as their funding remains level and citizen science groups like, you know, Blue Water Task Force expands, but we don't, we don't have a $10 million budget just for our program. You know, we, we're filling in the gaps where we can, but more investments definitely needed to monitor our beaches, to make sure that people have a safe, healthy experience. And it's not just for public health, it's for our economy as well, because, you know, tourism at the beach is a massive, massive economy in every coastal state. And it's really people's trust in safe, healthy beaches that makes that happen. And we, we need to protect it. So I want to read some pretty astonishing statistics. The CDC estimates that over 5 million people are sickened annually from swimming in contaminated water. 80% of beaches tested exceeded state health standards at least once in 2024. 25% of all samples measured high bacteria rates. That's up from 22% in 2023. And nearly 10 trillion gallons of untreated stormwater runoff flow into U.S. waterways every year. That includes road dust, oil, animal waste, fertilizers, and other chemicals. And about 900 billion gallons of raw and untreated sewage are discharged into local waterways and oceans each year. Those are astonishing numbers and really sickening numbers because both sewage and stormwater runoff contribute to human illnesses, of course, harmful algae blooms, coral reef die-offs, and severe harm to wildlife. It's the number one cause of beach closures and swimming advisories. What do you see are some of the biggest gaps in U.S. federal beach water quality policies today? For beach water quality, after proper monitoring and, and supporting those programs, which are protecting people's use and enjoyment of our beaches, I think the next thing which we haven't adequately done as a society, as a country, is really maintain our wastewater infrastructure properly. Elected officials like to have their, a plaque with their name on it, on a bridge, on a highway. There's something to brag about there. You know, everyone, both parties like to talk about investments in infrastructure. You can congratulate yourself, you know, when you take a photo in front of the bridge. I think I know what you're going to say, but people don't, members of Congress and local officials don't want to have their name on a wastewater facility. Or unseen pipes that are under the ground, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's just been too easy to ignore Many of our sewer systems were installed 100 years ago with a predicted lifetime of 50 years. Meanwhile, coastal populations grow and grow and grow and grow every single year. So the pipes haven't been maintained properly. The facilities are operating over capacity. And then add climate change on top of the whole thing where our ground is becoming more saturated with water as flooding increases, sea level rises. It's just this sort of perfect storm of wastewater not functioning properly. And we need to do a better job of taking care of that. Mara, so along those lines, what infrastructure investments are most urgently needed to protect coastal water quality in a warming climate? Yeah, it's twofold. It's addressing our sewer systems and the pipes and the treatment. There's a lot of areas that are still on septic systems and even cesspools, which really do very little treatment at all. And again, as sea levels rise, as we get these big massive storms moving through and the ground gets saturated with water, they don't really treat waste at all. And then investments made to hold on to our rain and not let it become stormwater runoff in the first place. You know, there's all sorts of different nature-based solutions, green infrastructure that can be implemented on the community scale so that we are allowing water to seep into the ground and become part of the watershed and not just be shot down the road into a channel and out into the ocean or the bay with a ton of pollution with it. Finally, I want to ask what's next for the Blue Water Task Force and maybe more importantly, how can our listeners get involved in your mission? Yeah, well, the Blue Water Task Force is always continuing to expand. Across the country, we have about 85 Surfrider chapters right now, and I think somewhere in the realm of 150 or so student clubs. And I'm always getting inquiries from new chapters that want to start a testing program. So there's a lot of interest there. And the chapters that have been testing are really, we're really starting to reach new audiences now. I think there's just more awareness as we've been issuing our clean water report for so many years now. People are just becoming more aware of it in the communities where we are testing. 
thing. And then some of our more veteran programs are really starting to dig in now and not just testing and sharing information, but establishing collaborations within their community to really pull together the stakeholders to say, okay, we've been measuring high bacteria levels at this beach, at this creek for how many years? What are we going to do about it? So we're seeing a lot of good progress there, which is very exciting. As far as your listeners, I would say, number one, we would love to have you join Surfrider. Like, go to surfrider.org and, you know, support us, join us, become a member, be part of our mission to protect and enjoy ocean waves and beaches. And then look up our Blue Water Task Force program and see if we're testing near you and know before you go. Take a look and see what the water quality conditions are near you. Mara, I really appreciate this. I know we'll stay in touch. For our listeners, you can visit the Surfrider Foundation website, very easy to find, and you can learn more about what Mara and her team are doing and the good work that they're really doing on behalf of us all. So I want to really thank you for coming on today, and I hope our listeners and you have a great summer. Yeah, great. You too. Thank you. Have fun in Malibu. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 